Good afternoon. I'm Ronnie Ryder. And welcome to my panel, How to Write Likeable Humans, uh, generally in human and equestria stories. Um, there's this sort of stigma when writing human and equestria stories, um, generally that they generally are stupid. <laughs> People can't write humans very well, and I'm not really sure why that is. We're all around. We've all met well-developed people. Um, maybe not you. <laughs> I don't know. I never met you. Um, the first really good way to write a very likable human and equestrian character is to have him wake up and punch Celestia in the face so hard, half of the main six grow mustaches. <laughs> yes. This is uh, the final line of my uh, only Human and Equestria series, uh, the non brony verse. I don't know if any of you have read it and heard of it. Is that the one where it's like, I'm not a brony, get me out of here or something? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's the final line in the first chapter. Uh, with all of the quiet dignity and grace I can muster, I walk up to Celestia and punch her in the face. And that one line is probably the only reason I'm standing in front of you now, because after I wrote that chapter, the story just exploded. Which kind of freaked me out a little bit, actually. But anyway, uh, the problem that a lot of writers uh, fall into when writing human and equestria characters is generally they fall into several different stereotypes. It's a lot of, okay, so what would I do if I was in equestria without really thinking of, hey, what would realistically happen? Oh, yes, I'd marry. Uh, Twilight and Fluttershy immediately, and then okay, uh, and then I uh, become the fifth element or the seventh element of harmony, and I'd adopt, adopt Scootaloo, and I'd solve all of the world's problems. And no, um, Equestria is no more of a utopia than Earth is. It's better in some ways, but um, not the point where fixed. The number one thing about writing the human and equestria stories is you have to make the human, if not likable, then at least interesting. You don't have to make him somebody that you'd like to hang out with. Sometimes you could make him somebody that you enjoy punching in the face. But you have to make him interesting. And this doesn't even necessarily apply to human and equestrias specifically. But the stories in general, you want to know what happens next to your protagonist. Otherwise, I'm just going to close the X tab and go, I, I really don't care. This means nothing to me. You have to make sure that your readers get emotionally involved on some level. Otherwise, it's not going to leave any impact on them. So, uh, so I'm making this up as I go along, just like I do with my stories, and, <laughs> and it works a lot better with my stories. So are you more of a seat of the pants writer? Or like oh yeah, very writer? much so. Okay. Oh yeah, oh yeah. A lot of the stuff that he does um, in his stories, I've made 12 of them so far, and most of them are just, <laughs> wouldn't it be funny if that happened to him? Wouldn't it be funny if he became an Alagorn princess? I think that'd be funny quarter of a million words later and now he's leading Equestria into World War One. <laughs> yeah. Out of a story idea that I thought, oh, maybe I can drag this out for 40,000 words or something. Yeah, maybe it'll be fine. And that's another thing that's not necessarily human and Equestria specific, but story specific. You as the author are not necessarily in control of this story. And when I say not necessarily, you're not in control at all. You are merely a conduit through which the story flows. So when 
So I mean, it's good to plan out. Um, I think it was Eisenhower who said something to the effect of, plans are useless, but planning is indispensable. So yeah, you can have ideas of, okay, I wanted to go there next, but as you're sitting down and writing, okay, yeah, this, this could be interesting. You, you, an idea could pop into your head and go, oh, that's way better than what I thought of. And you totally scrap everything that you had planned. I never planned for this to be 12 books and millions of words. No, I thought this would just be a 30,000 word short fic that I could just go, okay, yeah, that, that, that'll be fine. But anyway, uh, basically you have to... The ponies are very human-like. They're anthropomorphic, I believe is the word. So there are their own fleshed out, developed characters. So they have their own personalities, their likes, dislikes. They have their own lives. And yes, a human coming into that life would be earth-shattering. Would be, it would change it a lot, but they wouldn't bend their whole life around that human to completely accommodate them. Uh, the example I used in one of my stories was uh, the main five had lives before Twilight showed up. And then Twilight showed up, and did she make a huge impact on their lives? Absolutely she did. Became great friends. Did Applejack stop fucking apples? Did Pinkie Pie stop throwing parties? Or Rarity stop uh, designing dresses? No. She didn't flip their lives around completely. She just made an impact. And the human and equestrian character does much the same thing, especially if you're going to make him, you know, a relic. Uh, and obviously, uh, Mary Sue's is a very dangerous bit of territory to go into, especially if you want to make your character an alicorn. Turn, turn a human into an alicorn, like I did. <laughs> did. Did people like that, or were they... They loved it. Okay, it doesn't work. It's the most popular TV story. Yeah. So what do you think you did different about making your character an alicorn match? I mean, I think... We're all familiar with the concept of an alicorn OC that just everybody absolutely hates because it's overused, it's tried, it's just mm -hmm. disgusting. Yeah. So what do you think you did differently that made your character likable and even as an alicorn? Yeah. And then firstly, feel free to ask any questions at any point. Just raise your hand if you have any questions. Um, well, uh, first off, he was already a pre-established character. So that definitely helped. They already were invested in his personality. They already knew his likes, dislikes, interests. They were already emotionally invested in him. They already knew what his life was. And they knew, okay, yeah, he's living in Ponyville. He's the town janitor, essentially. He's teaching Shirley's Falls about his world. And he's content with that. So when I go, wouldn't it be funny, instead of Twilight, it's him? They all went, oh, that's pretty cool. Also, um, a big part of what makes people dislike alicorn OCs is that they're very often Mary Sue's because, you know, we look at the alicorns in the show and they seem to be extraordinarily powerful. Seem to be being the key word. The only thing we've ever seen Celestia solve is a wanted needed spell. <laughs> oh my gosh, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> It's the only thing she's ever fixed. She said Twilight do everything else. She raises the sun. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> we know that Twilight. <laughs> well, sorry, Your Majesty, but we know Twilight could do it if you disappeared. So theoretically, alicorns throughout fan fiction have had um, varied interpretations. We know they're immortal, if not, or at least long lived. Um, they are powerful. I mean, I don't see Rarity raising the sun, although <laughs> uh, stuff like that. So it's a very big temptation when you write your Alicorn OC to make your human or Alicorn OC all powerful right away. They now have the power to solve everything they want to, which, as we've seen in the show, Celestia can't solve everything she wants to. Despite her best efforts, she sends Twilight to do it. Even when she tried to fight Chrysalis, she got her 
plot warped. Yeah, yeah, it's true. <laughs> Don't try to deny it. All you had to do was throat punch her. You didn't need to use this. <laughs> and a congratulations to you for <laughs> fight, fight, fight. Anyway, um, I'll put money on that. <laughs> Ooh, this just turned into a very different panel. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, in my story, I had him start out as a novice. He didn't know how to do anything. I mean, the very first thing that he does when he finds out he's an alicorn, he punches Celestia in the face. And then she punches him in the face right back. And they have a big fist fight. Uh, or hoof fight, whatever you want to call it. And he tries to use magic against her, and he can't do it. Just because he's an alicorn now doesn't mean he's all-powerful. He has to work his way towards that over the course of several years. Anyway, uh, another thing about uh, Mary Sue's and, you know, just humans in general is a lot of the times when humans are put into uh, Equestria, they pretty much do whatever they want with no consequences. And that's boring. So when TD punches Celestia in the face, TD's the main character's name, the half of the main six that grew mustaches in this picture, they start beating the crap out of it. I mean, why not? Just punch their almighty ruler and whatever. And even when he becomes an alicorn, he does some pretty objectively terrible things. Uh, I don't know how many of you have seen Pan's Labyrinth, the uh, bottle scene, where he's interrogating the two farmers and one of them won't shut up, so he takes the bottle. Well, he does that. To a prisoner of war. Yeah. And... In a less developed character, just be a, oh, well, that's okay. I know you didn't really mean it, but he's actually, I don't want to say punished for it, but he's chewed out for it. And he's let, Celestia lets him know, this is really not okay. And he has to learn and develop from his mistakes, which is what makes a character interesting. Because static characters are boring. If, if TD was the same as in chapter one as he is in the, chapter 10, as he is in chapter 20, well, that's just boring because he's reacting to the same thing the same way. I mean, just like how you're not the same person you were a year ago and the person you are now, you're not going to be in the same 10 years from now or even two. So why should it be any different for the character you're developing over however long in your stories? So character development is very, very important. Uh, that definitely makes your uh, human likable. Also, motivations. He has to want something, he or she. He, has to, he or she has to want something now that they're in Equestria. Otherwise, they're just kind of, okay, I'm here, I guess. Um, oh, it's Twilight, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that's boring. Nobody wants to read about that. It was uh, Kurt Vonnegut, I believe, who said, everyone, every character should want something, even if it's only a glass of water. Discord took that to heart, very, very literally. <laughs> <laughs> so you really have to figure out with your human character how he got there, what he wants now that he's got there, how he's going to get it, and what he's going to do when he gets it. Sometimes that answer is, Die. He wants to save Equestria, he sacrifices himself to do it. Okay. So long as he fits into the world in a realistic way, uh, it's just kind of boring if he becomes suddenly the most important thing ever. Nobody likes reading about that, with some exceptions. Uh, you know, Equestria Daily did those writing prompts give us a really bad story. Here's really bad story prompts, but see if we can work well with any story prompts. So honestly, it uh, really all depends on what you're after with your character. So I don't know, not, are there any questions or comments or, oh, you suck, I hate TV. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
At the top of your head, which chapter was the hardest for you to write in terms of you have to keep going back and rewriting it because it just did not feel right every time? I don't know. There's a lot of them. Uh, is there, is there just, one in particular that just stands out? In any one of them? Any, any one? Not really. I mean, I know there are definitely moments in my stories where I'll publish the chapter and people will go, uh, you rushed that. Or that didn't get developed as well as it should have. Or I don't really think you would actually act like that. And I'd go, huh. You know, you're right. And so I'd go through and develop, and mostly the readers go, oh, that's much better. And I agree. Did you have to go through an editor first before you publish? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Several editors, uh, depending on the story. So The Life of a Non-Brony has two editors. TDB Alicorn Princess has one. If nothing else, I at least run it through a Word document first. Because you pick up stuff. You know, just little... You f oh, I forgot to capitalize the word at the beginning of a sentence. Oh, you don't actually spell her that way. Oops. Or, you know, I mixed up two words, that kind of thing. Put the wrong there. Even, even doing that can help a lot. People in the comments will still point it out. And that's fine. That's, I really do appreciate it when people in the comments point out typos I made. It makes me feel like an idiot. <laughs> but it works. It makes my story better whenever whatever works to make it better. Uh, what programs do you use? Do you use Microsoft Word, Scrivener, or Google Docs, or I don't know what you like? I just post straight on to Fim Fiction. Oh really? Is it a good enough editor for that? I mean, when I send stuff to my editors, I use Google Docs. And that's really good because, you know, you can leave comments on the side, which is good also for pointing out, hey, you missed an A here, or I don't know if the character really say it that way, or snarky comments. Those are the best. <laughs> I'm an editor for uh, Changar Kordaf, uh, who did the winning verse. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that, but... Mm -hmm. Yep, I edit for him and Penstroke actually. And yeah, the best part of editing any story is writing snarky comments about whatever the story is. You know. Do you have like a specific word count per day you're going towards, or you just write on inspiration, or what? Just, just write on inspiration. I can go three whole months without publishing anything, and I feel so bad. However, I do have a story going through moderation as we speak. Yeah, it's still going through moderation. Oh well. It's a uh, Siren's story set 22 years after Equestria, Rainbow Rocks. So, how many people like that? June 27th, I celebrated my third anniversary on Thin Fiction. So yeah, started June 27th, 2012. Published my first story. And it was terrible. I published my second story not long after that, and it was also terrible. You work at it, you know? And sometimes working at it means having a shirtless dunce punch some butt in the face. So roughly, you write 1,400 words a day, like average. Sorry, I just did some quick math. Sure. Okay. <laughs> I, I, sorry, I did the statistical analysis of my little pony fan fiction. Okay. Like, I, that was the box I do. And you're like way up there. You're number three, like most viewed, number three, like most commented. You're really famous as far as, well, just looking at the statistics goes. I didn't see that statistics now. page. I know I'm number 10 on the follower count, but yeah. I didn't know, didn't know about any of the rest of that. What was your favorite chapter you I really love writing chapters where I drop bombshells on people. Oh, that is so much fun. Like the assassination scene in TV, The Allegorn Princess. Oh, just watching everyone in the comments flip out. It's amazing. You know, just, really good. Yeah, or the, the I mean, you, you all saw the, um, my screensaver pop up on those scorpion ponies. I just, uh, you'll appreciate this. I just finished <laughs> up a chapter where, <laughs> just finished up a chapter where a changeling tries to kidnap them and they're scorpions, changelings are bugs. So they eat it. <laughs> it was a controversial one to say the least. But yeah, no, that's, that's nothing compared to what I got coming up next.
or not next, but soon. Oh, boy, oh, boy. People are going to start sobbing, I'm laughing. I love making people cry. <laughs> That's the motivation. Yeah, pretty much. I'm just curious for your um, the secret, the secret life of rarity. Yeah. What was your motivation for that? Where did you get that idea? I used to do. I used to MST3K the episodes before Hasbro took them down because they're meanie heads. And copyright. Um, and it was during the episode. I was MST3K in the episode. Um, so look before you sleep with the sleepover between AJ and Rarity in Twilight. And I just, on a whim, improvised a line where Rarity was gonna kill Applejack because she was too messy or something. And it just blew up from there. When I started writing fan fiction, I went, huh, there's a thought. And then I started noticing little hints that the makers of the show had put in that there's a darker side to Rarity. And I went, oh, so Rarity's actually canonically a serial killer. Oh. <laughs> so I decided to make a fanfic out of that. You know, why not? I didn't expect it to go through into this big thing, but... So what's your favorite fanfiction that you haven't written? Favorite fanfiction that I haven't written? Ooh, that's a good one. Oh, um, Tyrant. Basically, uh, at the end of the pilot, instead of cleansing Luna from the Nightmare Moon kills her, and Celestia starts slowly going mad, and eventually she gets this iron grip on Equestria. She becomes a total totalitarian dictator over Equestria. And the main six have different jobs. Rarity, Twilight, and Pinky and Fluttershy all work directly for Celestia in Candlelock Castle. Rainbow Dash is a wonderful Applejack is completely content working on her farm, as Applejack would be. Uh, Twilight has a foal and Fluttershy's her nanny. And eventually, Rainbow Dash and Applejack are at the point of, we really can't stand this Celestia anymore, especially when she has the Royal Guards massacre a group of peaceful protesters. In a scene that would have, uh, I don't know if any of you have seen the Odessa step sequence from Battleship Potemkin, but that would have been, that was where I got the idea. So it blows up into this whole civil war and all of that, and. Lots of ponies die, and yeah. I still might write it. There's also one where Rainbow Dash gets kidnapped by the Changelings after the Battle of Canterlot. She's forced to work in their work camps with the other pony prisoners. That one I, I hope to write those two someday. We'll see. What's your favorite story to read, both uh, fan-related and outside of it? Outside of the fandom, my favorite book is And Then There Were None by Agatha Christie. That's really good. Well, there are a lot of one-shots that I really just enjoy reading over and over again. Mood Wings is a really good one. Uh, Nos Flutteratu, I enjoyed that one. Asylum by Demon of Decay. See, because the challenge is when you're writing fan fiction, you're going into you're going in with characters that the audience, or audience, the film minor, the readers already care about. So when you present a story with Twilight as the protagonist and make her look like Twilight and act like Twilight, you, you, you get the, 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 English is my second language. The first is nonsensical babble. <laughs> uh, and when you cast Twilight as the main character in your story, the audience is automatically invested because, hey, we all like the show, we're reading the story because we want to see good things happen at Twilight, or maybe bad things because you're a sadist jerk or something, I don't know. <laughs> we want to make sure they're okay. So we're already emotionally invested, but when you put a human character in, you're starting from square one. Basically, you have the challenge of the readers asking you, okay, this is a human. We've all known horrible humans we wish would die in a fire. Convince know. me that this is not one of them. Make me care about this guy. Or else I'm just going to hit X and move on to a flutter chord fanfic or whatever. Sorry, just curious. How many notifications do you get per day? 
Or are you just like, whoa, what the? I mean, or, I don't know. Depends on whether or not I've updated. Um, if I've published a new story, I can get 150 in a couple hours. Oh, wow. Especially if it hits number one at the feature box, that'll go for a while. I can, if I leave my, if I don't go on to thin fiction for a couple of days, I'll come back and I have 600 notifications. Well, and you can see it goes down to about, let's say I have 25 notifications and I log on to thin fiction and haven't been on in an hour. I click on it and it goes down to three because all I see is comments. And automatically purges favorites and stuff. So I just have to check the comments. It's really nice to it. Do you try to reply to every comment? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> Just the, the, there's the descendant method of let's write on everyone's user page anytime someone favorites something. But like, there's there's opposite ends of the spectrum too. Yeah. Have you seen his comments? They like this last one. The, the comments for the chapter alone went down for a long ways. Yeah, I can have on a really controversial chapter, like the assassination chapter of TD Alicorn. I had. 300 comments, normally a couple of them were from me. You know, when people freak out at a chapter, they comment yeah. a lot. I, I don't, if I can't reply to every comment, I'd still be replying to the first chapter of some story. So do you like to go in there and rile them up or taunt them? Or? I'm, I'm not, I don't feed the trolls, and that's just a bad thing to do. Um, if someone's legitimately being a troll, delete their comments and block them or whatever. Because why bother dealing with that kind of stuff? Who cares? Once you've done that, they can't do anything. You move on. And I've had some people say and do some pretty nasty stuff to me. If they're online, I'm probably never going to meet them. What do I care? I delete the comment and it goes away. I don't have to think about it. Um, but in terms of trying to rile them up, I don't try to get them angry, but I try to freak them out. Because that's just so much fun. <laughs> it's, like, uh, it's like watching ants scurry around and then <laughs> flip one on his back or something. And just, it's great. Okay, how do you know what key or what signs do you have to whether you're doing at least a decent job with your human character, or you're tiptoeing the line of having a bad Honestly, a lot of it is reader reaction. And that's not always a really good indicator of whether you have a good or bad character. <coughs> Twilight, Flame of Fifty Shades of Grey. If the readers are invested in the character himself, as opposed to, oh, what stupid stuff's gonna happen to him next, then, yeah, you've probably written a good character. If the readers are going, yeah, I only read this because he gets beaten up a lot and whatever. Well, then you could probably replace him with an OC pony and it wouldn't make a lick of difference. And that's really important. If you could replace your character with an inanimate object or a completely different background pony or whoever, then what's the point? But if you make a character that's completely indispensable to the story, totally unique, then people log on to fin fiction every day or get email notifications saying this story's updated oh yeah i get to read about more of his or her adventures or whatever then you know you got some how many how many people have like sent you personal messages uh complimenting your character design oh a lot of them yeah i get that a fair few even from people who i get people who contact me saying yeah my I had my friend read this not a brony story and he he's not a brony and I asked him, so what did you think? Did you think it was stupid? No. Really? Shut up, he's a good character. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so and that's I guess one of the big signs that you've made a really good character. He has a universal appeal. Honestly, if you can entertain and he's an indispensable part of the story and you couldn't just swap him out for piece of cardboard, you're on to something. And if you let the character develop naturally, people are going to be more drawn towards your character. And a large part of it is, well, how would somebody react to having their gender changed and their species changed, especially someone like this? You really got to know your character very well. A big test that I like to give is, and this, does, this also goes for 
all characters, not just human equestria, is describe your character without saying what he looks like, um, where he's from, what his role in the story is, what kind of costume he wears, or what relationship he has to the other characters. Describe him to me like I've never heard of My Little Pony or read your story, anything like that. So you couldn't say, oh, well, my character is from Colorado. He has red hair. He is. He's married to Truly. He's, you know, Ponyville janitor. That's, those aren't descriptors. That's, that's, that's nothing. Instead, you'd say he has a sarcastic sense of humor. He's very ornery, but he's great with children. And he's uh, loyal once you actually become a friend to him, which is something a little more difficult. I mean, he hates the situation that he's been put in, but, you know, he tries to make the best of it. Uh, he's very stubborn, you know, stuff like that. And the more descriptive you can get with stuff like that, the stronger the character. So, and the easier it is to put him into different situations and see how he'll react and develop. I keep saying he, but he or she. Sorry, this is a loaded question. You don't have to answer this if you don't want to. But um, you are really good at what you do. You do like crazy popular thing. They, they you've written 1.5 million words, and like you've written so much, and you've gotten a lot of practice honing the craft. Have you ever thought of uh, branching out and trying to write original fiction so you can actually oh, yeah. make money with it? Oh yeah. Not that I haven't made money off of this. Totally have. But, uh... Hmm? You made money off of fan fiction? Yeah. Oh. You do that. Get married. <laughs> Start a, uh, Indiegogo saying, Hey, I need help with my wedding, bonding. Sweaters are expensive. And there's just a million little details you can never even think of. Just the dress, the cake, and all of the venue and all that, but oh yeah, you gotta get the bridesmaids flowers. So I use this to help supplement my income. Whatever that's supposed to be. I've heard it's where you get money, but I don't know. So you ever uh, published short stories or like, tried to self-publish something on Amazon or anything like that? Not yet, but uh, you know, honestly, I think it'll happen when an idea pops in that I think I could feasibly do. That's how this got started. Well, you're certainly crazy qualified, so <laughs> looking, looking forward to you driving that bestseller. That'd be interesting. Uh, yeah, I hope I'm not one of those bestsellers of, yeah, it's the bestseller, but, oh gosh, it's awful. <laughs> I know. <laughs> doesn't matter, maybe. It kind of does matter. Okay. It matters to me. My dad read a, my dad wrote a book. It's really popular and famous. It's awful. He doesn't have to talk. Anyway. <laughs> I've written awful stuff on fake fiction before. Sturgeon's Law applies to me, too. <laughs> yeah. So I guess that's our cue to... Any last words? Oh, oh, gosh, no, 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 no. <laughs> final thoughts. Oh, that's final that's thoughts. That's oh, okay. Don't let me find You'd be surprised how resilient I am under pressure. Thank you all for coming. Um, I know I wasn't completely eloquent, but I hope I at least got something in your brains that can help you at least start if you want to write some form of human and equestria story. Um, yeah, that's, I hope you all at least enjoyed this passively, and I'm glad I could at least make you laugh once or twice. So, yeah, thank you. Great!